like to move on to introduce the final speaker of today's session, that's Dr. Ian McIlchrist. Ian is a psychiatrist, a writer and a former Oxford literary scholar. He first became well known uh, with his bestseller book, The Master and His Emissary, which was subtitled The Divided Brain and the Making of the Western World, which was published in 2009. In it, he argues that the hemispheric specialization in the brain is not so much one of left brain equals analytical and right brain equals creative, so what the brain, the hemispheres do, but much more one of how each hemisphere processes information, with the left, left hemisphere being detail oriented and the right more holistic. Um, and furthermore, he argues that this has led to the evolution of Western culture. Ian read uh, English at New College in Oxford, then later retrained in medicine and worked as a neuroimaging researcher at John Hopkins in Baltimore. Um, and he's worked as a consultant psychiatrist in, uh, in the, at the Maudsley in London. He lives on the island of Skye, which I know to be a very beautiful place off the coast of Scotland, and he continues to write and deliver many lectures and interviews. He has a new book coming out very shortly, I think it might be next week, um, which is on epistem epistemology and metaphysics. It's called The Matter with Things, and in it he argues that consciousness should be conceptualized as being a relational thing rather than an object, and he's going to tell us all about it. Ian. The floor is yours. <laughs> well, thank you very much, uh, Sarah, and thank you for inviting me to such an interesting event. Because I'm rather keen on abiding by rules, I, I decided to make sure I would be less than 25 minutes, and so I have written uh, a script. Uh, so here goes. In a very short presentation, there's no possibility for, of arguing for a position on consciousness, so I'll simply state my conclusions, argued for at length in my new book, The Matter with Things, Our Brains, Our Delusions, and the Unmaking of the World. Consciousness is irreducible, primordial, and omnipresent, not a thing, but a creative process. Matter is a theoretical abstraction that no one has seen. The term clearly has meaning, however. It refers to the qualities of certain elements within consciousness which offer relative resistance and relative permanence as a necessary part of that creative process. I cannot avoid referring or pass on to the hemisphere hypothesis expounded in the master and his hemisphere and greatly developed in the matter with things. Again, there is no possible way I can give an account of the argument here. What one needs to know, however, is that the two hemispheres have evolved so as to attend to the world and therefore bring into being the only world we can know in two largely opposing ways. The left hemisphere paying narrowly targeted attention to a detail that we need to manipulate, the right hemisphere paying broad, open, sustained, vigilant, uncommitted attention to the rest of the world while we focus on our desired detail. This means that each hemisphere brings into being a world that has different qualities. These could be characterized in the simplest possible terms, something like this. In the case of the left hemisphere, a world of things that are familiar, certain, fixed, isolated, explicit, abstracted from context, disembodied, general in nature, quantifiable, known by their parts, and inanimate. In the case of the right hemisphere, a world of gestalten, forms and processes that are never reducible to the already known or certain, never accounted for by dissolution into parts, but always understood as wholes that both incorporate and are incorporated into other wholes, unique, always changing and indeed flowing, interconnected, implicit, understood only in context, embodied and animate. The left hemisphere is a world of atomistic elements, the right hemisphere one of relationships. Most importantly, the world of the right hemisphere is the world that presences to us, that of the left hemisphere, a representation. In other words, after the fact, when it's no longer actually present. The left hemisphere, a map, the right hemisphere, the world of experience that is mapped. In this talk, I've chosen to make some very simple reflections on one aspect of consciousness, uh, 
its relational nature. Indeed, I hold that everything is relational and that what we call things, the relata, are secondary to relationship. Consciousness is always of something. What is the nature then of that something that is both in part constitutive of and in part constituted by that relationship? In the last century or so, there's been a tendency, at least in popular discourse, to pull reality in opposing directions. Some scientists, whether they put it this way or not, when they're asked to reflect, still carry on as if there just exists a reality out there, which conveniently spells rot, the nature of which is independent of any consciousness of it, naive realism. These are usually biologists. You won't find many physicists who would think like that. In reality, we participate in the knowing. There is no view from nowhere. As John Archibald Wheeler put it, this is a participatory universe. Of crucial importance is that this fact does not in any way prevent science legitimately speaking of truths far from it. We desperately need what science can tell us and postmodern attempts to undermine it should be vigorously resisted. Two important truths then. Science cannot tell us everything, but what science can tell us is pure gold. Any attempt to suppress science, I distinguish science sharply from technology, for whatever reason, is dangerous and wrong. Meanwhile, on the other hand, there are philosophers of the humanities who think that there is no such thing as reality since it's all made up miraculously by ourselves which fortuitously spells mumbo, naive idealism. Such people, by the way, never behave as though there was no reality, nor, of course, by its own logic, can they claim any truth for their position. These viewpoints are closer than they look. One party fears that if what we call reality were in any sense contaminated by our involvement in bringing it about, it would no longer be worthy of being called real. The other fear is that, since we manifestly do play a part in its coming about, it's already the case that it can't be called real. But just because we participate in reality doesn't mean we invent it out of nowhere or solipsistically project it on some inner mental screen. Much less does it mean that the very idea of reality is thereby invalidated. I take it that there is something that's not just the contents of my mind, that, for example, you exist. There is an infinitely vast, complex, and multifaceted whatever it is that exists apart from ourselves. The only world that any of us can know then is what comes into being in the never-ending encounter between us and this whatever it is. What is more, both parties evolve and are changed through the encounter. It is how we and it become more fully what we are. The process is both reciprocal and creative. You could think of it as like a true and close relationship between two conscious beings. Neither is, of course, made up by the other, but both are to some extent, perhaps to a great extent, made what they are through the relationship. The relationship comes before the relata, the things that are supposed to be related. What we mean by the word and is not just additive, but creative. There is no one absolute truth about the world that results from this process, but there are certainly truths. Some things we believe will be truer than others. The nature of the attention we bring to bear is of critical importance here. A maximally open, patient and attentive response to whatever it is, is better at disclosing or discerning reality than a response that is peremptory, insensitive or above all, shrouded in dogma. Importantly, what we experience is not just an image of a world outside, in some sense, some sort of projection on the walls of a Cartesian theatre inside our heads and watched by an intracerebral homunculus on an intracerebral sofa. 
Such a viewpoint could be predicted to arise from the left hemisphere's attempt to deal with a reality it does not understand and for which everything is a representation. True, we can deceive ourselves by mistaking our own projections for reality, and we often do. But that does not entail that we are always victims of self-deception. When we are properly attentive, what we experience is the real deal, though it be only a tiny part of all that is. To appreciate that, you need the right hemisphere, and preferably, of course, both hemispheres, to be in play. It's true that we can see the world only partially, but we still each see the world directly. It's not a representation, but a real presence. There isn't a wall between us and the world. Our experience is of whatever it is and not another thing, even if we can't get away from the fact that it is we who experience it. Yet, I say, we take part in its creation. How can that be? An analogy may help get closer to what I mean. There is such a thing as Mozart's G minor quintet. It is, in a way, quite specific. It certainly is not a fantasy, and it cannot be made up by me any way I want. However, it doesn't exist in the closed score on my bookshelf. The potential alone is there. It doesn't exist in Mozart's mind either, because he's dead, and the moment when he died made no difference whatever to the existence or the nature of the quintet. And there isn't a single ideal quintet, in some platonic sense, that we're always imperfectly imitating in our encounters with it. It keeps coming into being. It keeps becoming, each time a mind, with all its history and preconceptions, encounters it, or when many minds do so together. Each time it will be real, and each time it will also be different. In other words, it's inexhaustible, although it will be recognizably the same piece of music. It's certainly not a matter of anything goes. Not every rendition will be equally good or equally true to the spirit of the quintet, and saying so should not be a problem. In life, we don't find it difficult to discriminate between better or worse performances, and crucially, we expect at least a degree of consensus on the matter among those who know enough to recognize a good performance when they hear one. However, no one would expect me to say precisely how I know that it is a true performance of the work, let alone to prove to them that it is. At best, I could point to certain aspects of the performance and hope my fellow listener picks up. And that's not just because of the particular nature of music. No one expects me to say how I know that my understanding of Hamlet is more or less true either. As a critic of Hamlet, I state what I see. People either click with what I say, get an insight from it, or don't. They either feel that I, and now they, know more about Hamlet, or they don't. This is not to give a single crumb of comfort to the my view is as good as yours types. There are, very clearly, better and worse interpretations. I could get it indisputably wrong, for example, by claiming it's really an account of peasant life in Azerbaijan in the 10th century, or less dramatically, but nonetheless clearly, by claiming that it is primarily a critique of James I's foreign policy. There are, in fact, an almost limitless number of ways in which I'm free to get it wrong. Philosophy may at times aspire to be, but cannot ever be coercive. It cannot compel to a point of view. It can only allow an insight to dawn. Plato described the process as a spark that crosses a gap. Suddenly, a light, as it were, is kindled in one soul by a flame that leaps to it from another. That's a quote from the seventh epistle. The experience of understanding involves a shift from what seems initially chaotic or formless to a coherent, stable form or picture, a gestalt, or from an existing gestalt to a new and better one that seems richer than the one it replaces. The flow of the universe is always creative, though it has order. 
and is not random or chaotic. The world is always a matter of responsiveness, though it's equally not a free-for-all. It's a process of creative collaboration, of co-creation. In that spirit, I now want to modify my image of the quintet, which corresponds to some, but not all, aspects of reality. What if the music is not Mozart, but something more like some sublime jazz, or an Indian raga, or Portuguese fado, something we improvise, within bounds? Whatever it is will emerge from a balance of freedom and constraint. It won't exist until it's being performed. No one can know exactly what it will be like. But it will not be random. It will emerge from the player's continuous interaction and from the music's own history as it unfolds. What comes next will be anticipated by what has gone before. It will also be molded by the imagination, skill and training we bring and shared expectations quite apart from the fundamental laws of acoustics. Our co-creation of the music doesn't occur ex nihilo, and it's not just a projection of ourselves, yet we and you partake of its making, even if we are only listeners. Our immersion in a culture of recorded music in which we are passive and inert consumers encourages us to think of music as a thing, separate from the hearer and the musicians who make it. Yet any performer who's had the experience of being taken up by the flow of music or dance or song, of being in the groove, knows this is a dreadfully reductive account. To be in the groove, in the flow, is to feel oneself played by as much as playing the music. As Yeats says, how can we know the dancer from the dance? Again, just because I use music as an example, I'm obviously not making a point specifically about music. Music happens to be a very clear case of how what we take to be a thing emerges from a complex of relationships, both those between notes and those between individual consciousnesses. But all our experience, not just in music, but in life, both mental and physical, is of such a complex flow, a constantly unfolding, responsive dance of reciprocal gestures. It exists in process and in relationship. Our taking part in that reciprocity does not leave us inhabiting a solipsistic fantasy, but precisely confirms that it is not a solipsistic fantasy. We interact with one another and the world at large in myriad ways without being able to have more than limited control of the outcome. What comes to be does so through an interaction of a multiplicity of elements, some ours, some not. Whatever it is that exists apart from ourselves then creates us, but we also take part in creating whatever it is. By this, I do not only mean the common sense view that I have an impact on the world as the world has an impact on me, that I leave my footprints. That would lead immediately to the reflection that I'm very small in relation to the world. And so effectively, my impact is so small that for all intents and purposes, it can be ignored. There is, it might seem, an inexpressibly vast universe and an inexpressibly tiny individual consciousness. Such a reflection seems to posit an objective position, a view outside of history or geography, time or space, a view from nowhere in which all can be measured and compared. It implies, in fact, a measurer of all the measurers, measuring the other scales and putting each part in its place according to its overall worth. But though that cannot be, the alternative is not just a merely subjective position either. This very polarity, subjective, objective, is misleading. In the fado, in the raga, in jazz, it is what it is because of me, and I'm what I am because of it. Similarly, whatever it is, is potential only until the encounter. In each authentic encounter, 
one in which the individual truly apprehends it and is apprehended by this other, the other becomes fulfilled. Each time this comes about in a unique fashion, but one that is not alien to the coming into being of that other as a whole. And the actualization, which at first seems to be a narrowing or collapse of potential, positively adds to the now enlarged field of the potential, which only discovers itself through the repetition of such actualizations. Within my experience of the world, very much can be changed by my response to whatever it is. In a sense, everything can be changed. Though that may seem to be just for me, how big or small is that? We cannot weigh consciousness against the universe. It's like trying to say precisely how much you love someone if you really love them. It's not fixable in space or quantitative, but qualitative and experienced in the living flow of time. And if things turn out to be interconnected, not atomistic, and they are, each consciousness has its impact on the universe that cannot be quantified. Does this mean that there's no such thing as being wrong? Of course not. Though there can be no rules for jazz, indeed, if it merely followed rules, it would no longer be jazz. There are many things that just can't be done, much as in the middle of a flamenco dance, whose form is not predetermined, one cannot suddenly start balancing on one's heels or stop and scratch one's nose or do the can-can without the dance ceasing to be. Flamenco is more formalized than jazz, but even in jazz, there's literally no end to the list of what one doesn't do. However, there's no recipe, no procedure or algorithm to follow for getting it right either. An algorithm is what the left hemisphere wants. The recognition that it's got to be free of any algorithm, yet not at all random, is characteristic of the understanding of the right hemisphere. We can specify what is not jazz, but not what is. Our knowledge of anything unique is similarly apophatic. Just as and is not merely additive, not is not merely negative. Both are highly creative. Indeed, resistance, notness, is an absolute necessity for creation. That of which I have no inkling, whatever I just don't get or see, doesn't exist for me. That manifestation of whatever it is, is simply not available in my world. But this doesn't mean that things come and go from everyone else's reality dependent on my understanding of it. If I can't see the moon, that doesn't mean it stops being there for others. If we're all tuned into the same whatever it is, and I believe it makes no sense to assert that we are not, something very like what I can't see is probably being seen by others, and ultimately that will affect me. It's perfectly possible to be deceived about or to be in, den in denial about an aspect of whatever it is. Truth, like reality, is an encounter. It is in the nature of an encounter that more than one element is involved. And what I find in whatever it is does not pre-exist my encounter with it. There must be a potential true enough, but it is actualized only in my encounter with it. The encounter is genuinely creative the whole universe is constantly creative, but not out of nowhere. We're dealing here with a phenomenon or process whose shape can be intuited, but to which our everyday language is not well adapted. When the world is viewed as a flow rather than an aggregate of bits mechanistically related and understandable only by reduction to parts, when the world is viewed as a flow, as I say, albeit a differentiated one, rather than a, just a succession of points or a world of things, these problematic formulations can be approached from a fresh point of view, wherein many of the difficulties get to be resolved. The world, I suggest, is a seamless, always self-creating, self-individuating, and simultaneously self-uniting flow that is only truly knowable as it comes to be known. I say it for convenience, it's a question 
worth considering whether this is the appropriate pronoun. It is like a stream with its whirlpools and eddies that come into being for a time and resolve. While they're there, they're present to all observers, even measurable up to a point. And yet, while distinct, they're inseparable from the stream, not just in the sense that without the stream they do not exist, but in the sense that they are the stream. We are just such eddies in the stream. And creativity is always discovery of the self as well as of the other. Once one sees this, the objectivizing, time-denying, change-denying, diagrammatic mentality of modern Western thinking appears, as I believe it is, a hindrance, not a help on the path to truth. The world, we know then, cannot be wholly mind-independent and it cannot be wholly mind-dependent. Once again, this leaves no room for a philosophy of anything goes. What is required is a maximally open, attentive response to something real and other than ourselves, of which we have only inklings at first, but which comes more and more into being through our response to it, if we are truly responsive to it. We nurture it into being, or not. In that, it has something of the structure of love. Thank you. Thank you. That was inspiring. Um, I'm sure we have plenty of questions, but I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative and maybe ask you the first one. Um, you speak about it being very important that we have a maximally open, attentive attitude so that we can respond appropriately to whatever comes at us in this flow. How would we do that? How do we create an open and attentive attitude? Well, I suppose at the most um, trivial level, one can, there are exercises that can be done in which one practices paying different kinds of attention to the world. They're meditative exercises. Yeah. But I think being aware, um, what I've tried to do is to raise awareness of the way in which our particular culture tends to use just one kind of attention, which is detailed focused, reductionist, uh, and only works from the bottom up. So that whatever we find at the most reduced level must be essentially what the whole complex out of which those details have been taken is like. But unfortunately, that doesn't happen to follow. No. Um, and so what I'm, con what I'm really um, contrasting here is this attention, which is very narrow, already committed to what it knows it's looking for, uh, then only finds what it was looking for, finds it familiar, mm. can see something new, sees it as isolated, decontextualized, it abstract and disembodied, instead of this living, flowing uh, universe, which I believe is consonant with the best philosophy, the best spiritual traditions and contemporary physics. Yes, thank you. We also have a viewer question. Fraser asks, um, language is symbolic and allows communication between consciousnesses. Um, can you not hear me? I can see all the speakers doing this. Is, uh, can you, the speakers hear me? Yes, good. Okay. Yes, I can. You can, good. Um, so language is symbolic and allows communication. Does that go against the bicameral understanding of the human brain, do you think? Um, well, no, it doesn't. Um, <laughs> language is a very complex area, and I devote a long chapter in an earlier book called um, The Master and His Emissary to the nature of language. It's contributed to by both the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere in importantly different ways. Um, it's a far too big an area to give you a summary of that chapter, but I would recommend you to it. It's chapter three. It's called Language, Truth and Music. And it's about the different aspects of language, differentiating between the kind of language which um, is purely denotative um, and other aspects of language which interpret meaning in context, understand um, the, the intonation and the uh, all that is not said, the implicit in language, mm. all that is metaphorical and so on. And it is actually through these elements, which are largely right hemisphere based, 
that we are able properly to communicate. Otherwise, we would be like computers constantly talking across purposes. Yes. But language is a very interesting uh, element that partakes of enormous amounts of um, humanity, not just the two hemispheres, but also very much the whole of the human body and beyond that. Thank you. Okay, we have a second question from the audience, which is, would you say that an encounter, a human encounter between two uh, human beings is a process or an event? Or does it matter what we, how we view that? I, I didn't hear what the crucial word is. A the human... En encounter. A human encounter. No, no, so other... a, a process or an event? A human encounter is a process and an event. Um, what it is not is, an, is a thing. W what I um, describe as an important concept is something I call betweenness, which is not just the gap between when there is a relationship, but something new that comes into being by the very coming together of these two elements, which can't be separated from the whole. One very concrete example is that of an electric circuit. Is the electricity in the positive terminal? No. Is it in the negative terminal? No. Is it just in the space between the terminals? No. It's in the whole betweenness, as I call it, of the coming together of these two poles and whatever new emerges from it. Now, a human relationship is that, and you can describe that as a process or an event. What you mustn't describe it as is a thing. Yes, thank you. Okay, we have a question from Bernardo, and he says, if consciousness is irreducible, what then, ontologically speaking, are the hemispheres and their correlations with qualia states? Well, the hemispheres are obviously matter. They're material elements within consciousness, like other matter. And they, uh, matter and consciousness are not uh, somehow incapable of interaction. They constantly interact. And what the brain does with consciousness is not, in my view, and I argue for this at some length in uh, my new book, is not to emit consciousness, nor even simply to transmit consciousness, but to permit consciousness, by which I mean it doesn't make consciousness up, and it doesn't simply act pass passively as a transmitter, but actually shapes consciousness. William James has a wonderful expression. He says that, it, it, and it's an analogy to the way the brain works with consciousness, is that if it were not for the obstructive effects of his vocal cords on the passage of air through his um, airways, he could have no voice. It's that obstruction um, that permits only certain frequencies, that enables something to come into being. So a, a theme of my new book is that resistance is essential to creativity of every kind. And in my view, the brain is that element of resistance that shapes human consciousness. It doesn't originate consciousness, but it shapes our consciousness. I think that all that exists exists in consciousness, that consciousness is the stuff of the cosmos. Matter is a phase of consciousness. It's not a, a separate thing it, 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 any more than ice is separate from water. It's a phase of water. It's neither lesser nor, nor more than water. It, it's not separate from water. It's a kind of water. And matter is a kind of consciousness for a time that has certain quite marked properties that are different from the way we normally think of consciousness. Yes. Just as, you know, water is transparent and flows and, and all the rest, and ice is hard and opaque and can split your head open. So they're, they're, they're different, but they're, they're part of the same uh, ontology. Yes. So uh, for, for me, the, the idea that, um, that the consciousness and matter have to be uh, they, can, they must be distinguished. Um, I argue strongly that they are distinguished, just as ice and water are, but they're not somehow, there should be no need to have to set the one against the other. And fields of energy, are, energy is, is into, um, convertible with matter, obviously. I mean, that's what E equals MC squared, in a way, tells us. Yeah. And so field, fields of energy are also aspects of consciousness. Consciousness has fields. Thank you. That's very clear.
All right. Um, I'd like to ask the other two speakers whether they have questions they'd like to pose to Ian before we move on to the panel discussion. Thank you so much, Ian, for this really beautiful talk. It really resonated with me, everything you said, and then very eloquently phrased. Um, yeah, I have a lot of things I was thinking of. Um, I wondered, do you also relate this idea of the two hemispheres to two ways to look at particles, like that they can be waves or particles? Um, is a, that related how you perceive that? Yes, it, it, that's a very, very interesting question. Um, and I'd, I'd like to just take a, a few sentences to answer it. At some very basic level, it would look like the left hemisphere collapses things into particles by its very specific attention to this measuring element in things. And that the flow of the wave is what exists until that attention is brought to bear on it. And that may well be true. Um, but there is something else, which is that there is a distinction between the ways in which the two hemispheres see the world, that the left hemisphere wants desperately to have something be either this or that. It wants black and white, it wants certainty, and it wants to know which category can I put this in. Come on, make up your mind. Whereas the right hemisphere is able to entertain ambiguity and ambivalence. It can do this cognitively in terms of ideas better than the left, but it can do it also in something called perceptual rivalry, which is um, where you can, you can can, you, you don't have to collapse with Wittgenstein's famous duck rabbit into either it's a duck or it's a rabbit. It can be a duck rabbit and it can have both facets. So um, I, I would say, if you like, the left hemisphere wants either or, the right hemisphere wants both and, but it also wants to bring the two hemispheres together, which the left hemisphere doesn't. The left hemisphere has an antagonistic relationship with the right hemisphere. The right hemisphere has a, a cooperative, collaborative relationship with the left hemisphere. So at the end of the day, the right hemisphere understands that we don't want either both and or either or, but both both and and either or. Thank you. Esme, did you want to follow up? I could. But you may, you maybe. may. Okay. Yeah, that's that's really a beautiful description of how I always feel these hemispheres are interacting. Right, right, right. I wondered, another thing I was thinking of was, how do you relate this? Because this is something I'm always struggling with, with this idea of you're kind of in the sphere of the earth. And then at some point, maybe through imagination and mathematics, we perceive this idea of the sphere when and that makes you into an observer of something you're in right in a way and I always find this very interesting kind of dualism which actually is not a dualism how do you yes. can you also put this into your hemisphere theory being part of the sphere and seeing the sphere while you're in it well I can because once again um, some people think that maybe it follows from my exposition based on a very extensive uh, survey of, of the neuroscience of hemisphere difference, which is a, a very rich area, largely neglected because of pop psychology. And people think that they've got all, which they have, false ideas. But people think that maybe the difference is that the right hemisphere is subjective and the left hemisphere is objective. But no, the difference is this. It is the left hemisphere that polarizes into this, there must be the subjective and the objective, whereas the right hemisphere sees that it is something that, as it were, bridges these two, because it's much more interested in relationship, in fact. So it's not that it collapses the distinctions of individuality, but it shows that they're not ultimately separate. A good example of this, from another physical uh, image, is a magnet. It's, it's quite clear that the North Pole and South Pole are distinct and separate. But there isn't, or at least they're, they're distinct, but perhaps I should say they're not separate in the sense that there is not a hard line between them. And you cannot have one without the other. But they together make a magnet. And in, in a sense, 
what I, I mean, obviously you can't immediately map that onto what I'm saying or have been saying. But my idea there is that rather than have this idea of, a, of an objective reality and a subjective reality, that there is a reality that the relationship that we have with it helps to form it and helps to form us. So that there is a union there that cannot be artificially split into subjective and objective. If people say to me, so do you reject the idea of objectivity altogether? I say no, because I think I honor what is meant by it, which is the idea to try to get away from too individual and limited a point of view. And the way to do that is not to inhabit no point of view, which can never be done, the sort of idea of having uh, no personal point of view, but to inhabit as many points of view as possible. And, and if you do that, you are less likely to be caught out by reality than if you stick to one particular point of view only. Mm -hmm.